So tonight, let's let's go and then and before we go anywhere, let's read both uh, Revelation four and five, and let's because that those two chapters are really you know in the original uh, uh, text, it was just one one chapter really because you will see the flow, and uh, like I said, I mean let's read it. Which version? Okay, AMP. So I mean. Read with me in your own, you know, even if you're muted, but read with me. After this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. So that's that's the scenario. And the first bo voice, which I had heard addressing me like the calling of a war trumpet. So think about that, that kind of sound. You've n we've never heard that kind before. We don't even know what that is. Uh, and it's saying, you know, that that blasting sound is inviting uh, John, the apostle, to come up here. And by the way, just a side comment, uh, evidently during the time of the book of Revelation, this revelation um, happened to John when he was in his 90s. I still have hope. All right, guys, in his 90s. So... But but imagine, imagine, you know, a sound of like a war trumpet. What is that like? And and the invitation to come up here. For what purpose? And I will show you what must take place in the future. So it's going to be additional revelatory on the revelation upon revelation. At once I came under the Holy Spirit's power and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Wow. Next. And he sat he who sat there appeared like the crystalline brightness of Jasper and the fiery sages and the and, and, and encircling the throne there was a halo that looked like a rainbow of emerald. Think about this. We will not, we're not just reading this for the purpose of reading, but for the purpose of getting a revelation as we read. 24 other thrones surrounded the throne and seated on these thrones were 24 elders, the members of the heavenly Sanhedrin. This is the court of God. These are uh, the people, his staff, you know, <laughs> so to speak. The, his government is right here. And arrayed in white clothing. I mean, for us to be given that description that those that are surrounding the throne of God, those that are in his court, those that are his his officers, his governments, they're all in white clothing with crowns of gold upon their heads. I can just, uh, you know, I can just imagine that those crowns were the accomplishments and, and uh what they have done when when they were on earth and you know it became theirs uh, it was placed on their heads when they went to heaven next and you know picture yourself picture yourself there and uh, don't don't let's not just allow john to be the only one to come in front of the throne of god let's go get in there let's let's go with him so verse 5 out out from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and in front of the throne seven blazing torches burned which are the seven spirits of god the sevenfold holy spirit and in another translation and um in the throne came came you know throbbings a throbbing you know uh, uh or um something that is uh i i, I don't know how to explain that but uh, a throbbing, a throbbing sound, just a, 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 a sound that, that, that depicts of life and, and living, you know, they're so alive. Heaven is so alive. And uh, next verse six, and in front of the throne, there was also what looked like a transparent glass, glassy sea. So that's kind of the, you know, instead of concrete, like what we see in our roadways, <laughs> we see transparent glass sea as if of crystal. I mean, just and around the throne in the center of its side of the throne were four living creatures 
our, our beings who were full of eyes in front and behind with intelligence as to what is before and at the rear of them. I mean, they can see in their back and in their front and on their side. They're so aware of what's going on. They see all the multidimensional uh, presence of God and depth of God. So verse 7, the first living creature being, being was a lot like a lion. And the second living creature like an ox. And the third living creature had the face of a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Actually, this uh, many of the commentaries would say that this is actually uh, the picture of the four uh, Gospels. Next. And uh, the four living creatures individually having six wings were full of eyes all over. Like I said, you know, last Sunday, I mean, I can't get over this. I mean, I don't know how many times I've read this, chapter 4 and chapter 5, uh, because of, you know, I need to understand more. I need to see more. Wow, what is in, what is this? We're full of eyes all over and within, underneath their wings. And day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, omnipotent, who was, is, and who is to come. And whenever the living creatures offer glory and honor and thanksgiving to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever through the eternities of eternities. That's why we're reading it in the Amplified because, oh my goodness. Okay, now this is now very, uh, so much more mysterious here, mystery here, so much more, wow. Uh, a super grand uh, uh, conversation next. Yeah, 24 elders, the members of the heavenly Sanhedrin, they fall prostrate before him who is sitting on the throne. And they worship him who lives forever and ever. And they throw down their crowns before the throne, crying out, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive the glory and the honor and dominion. For you created all things by your will. They were brought into being and were created. Okay, so uh, keep going. Chapter 5. And I saw lying on the open hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll or a book written within and on the back, closed and sealed with seven seals. Okay, this is now the seven seals that we will st start seeing next year in, in uh, chapter 6 and chapter 7, chapter 8 and so on. Verse 2, and I saw a strong angel announcing in a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and who is entitled and deserves and is morally fit to break its seal. So they're looking for who, who is worthy to open the scroll, who is worthy to take it, who, who deserves it, who is fit and morally equipped to do this. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth in the realm of the dead in Hades was able to open the scroll or take a single look at its contents. So this is this, you know, this is terrible. This is discouraging. Next. But here, here comes, here comes it. And so, you know, the same reaction that we probably would have was the same reaction that uh, uh, responds that, um, John, John did, and he, I, and he said, I wept audibly and bitterly. I mean, this is probably so, so, so sudden because no one was found fit to open the scroll or to inspect it, to look at it, to read it. Then one of the elders of the heavenly Sanhedrin said to him, stop weeping, John. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root source of David, has won, has overcome and conquered. So that's the description of who's going to, who's fit to take the scroll. He can open the scroll and break its seven seals. Next. And there between the throne and the four living creatures or beings, and among the elders of the heavenly Sanhedrin, I saw a lamb standing as though it had, be, it had been slain, with what? Seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, the sevenfold Holy Spirit, who have been sent on duty far and wide into all the earth. He then went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So, you know, we will talk about this uh, shortly, maybe next 
next Wednesday, but uh, we will look at it to, to the, tonight somewhat. Next. And when he had taken the scroll, so, you know, there's such a qualification. Uh, you got to be worthy to take the scroll. You got to be uh, fit. You got to be, you know, so, so equipped, so, so qualified to take the scroll. So the four living creatures and the 24 elders of the heavenly Sanhedrin prostrated themselves before the Lamb. So much obeisance is going on here. It was holding a harp, lute, or guitar, and they had golden bowls uh, full of incense, fragrant spices, and gums for burning, which are the prayers of God's people, the saints. So, um, so as 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 he uh, took the scrolls, Jesus took the scroll. I mean, everybody. I mean, they just bowed. They just go prostrate, and 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 some, you know, and part of this humbling before God is playing music, playing songs, and and prayers. You see, this worship and prayer is before the throne of God, and we will look at that on you know on the twenty seventh. We will look at the uh, uh, the importance of uh, intercession, prayer, intercession in the end times. Uh, why is that important? Because it, it is so key, uh, the prayers of the saints, the worship of the saints, so key in the last days. Uh, and uh, you and I, in, in prayer and in worship, we release, we will release the judgment of God. I'm getting ahead of myself. Next. And now they sing a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to break the seals that are on it, for you were slain, sacrificed, and with your blood you purchased man unto God from every tribe, language, and people, and nation, and you have made them a kingdom, a royal race, and priests to our God, and they shall reign as kings over the earth. And so you begin to see here, now, now uh, we're being told, uh, we're being told of the importance of uh, Jesus going to the cross. This is this is that, and we will talk about it next week. Next, and then then I looked and I heard the voices of many angels on every side of the throne of the living creatures and the elders of the heavenly Sanhedrin, and they numbered ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands. Like I said last Sunday, your calculator will explode and would not be able to contain all these numbers, saying in a loud voice, This serving is the Lamb who was sacrificed to receive all the power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and majesty, glory, splendor, and blessing. All right. So, and I heard every created thing in heaven and on earth and under the earth in Hades, the place of the departed spirits and on the sea and all that is in it, crying out together to him who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb be ascribed the blessing and the honor and the majesty and the glory and the splendor and the power, might, and dominion forever and ever through the eternities of the eternities. I mean, what is that? Have you ever asked yourself, what is eternities of the eternities? I mean, you know, from eternity to more eternity. Wow, that's where we will live, you know, uh, after this. Next. Then the four living creatures, uh, living beings said, Amen, so be it. And the elders of the heavenly Sanhedrin prostrated themselves and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. And, you know, I mean, always. These people, the, the court of God, in the court of God, the government of God is, you know, continually uh, bowing before him. They're all prostrated before him. This is the posture in heaven, humility, uh, obeisance, just bowing before God, consistently, continually submitting themselves to God. This is so powerful. All right. So uh, let's go back to... Uh, and then uh, let's go back to you. Let's go back to the gallery. Just so, you know, um, you see that. I don't know how you read this, <laughs> but there was a time uh, when I had all the young people read this 10 times for 10 days, 10 times a day for 10 days. 
And uh, I still do that. I still do that. Read it many, many, many times, you know, at times when I'm um, studying it and reading it. And still, I, um, I, I still want to see what, you know, the pulsing in the throne. What is that? What is that pulsing in the throne? A continuous evidence of life and living in a, in a powerful way. Uh, that's that's what the heavens is all about. So let's let's go to my first um, first notes there with you. Anybody want to say something about the what we read, chapter four and five? Because you know we will we will be here for three Wednesdays more. The 1120, 11, oh, well, tonight, 13, and then 1120 and 1127. And then we will end. And, uh, um, you know, during our vacation uh, time, our, our pause time, uh, I will be sending you some notes and some, some things to, some videos to listen to while, you know, you're taking breaks from your holidays. All right, so you don't, we don't have too much gap, too much space. But just, you know, in your devotional, you can look at that, you can study it, so on and so forth. All right, let's go to the, yeah. So I just wanted to just bring us here. In Revelation 4 and 5, John described the majesty of the Father's royal court in heaven and the glorious occasion when Jesus took a scroll from the Father indicating his right. To rule the earth. This is this is very very important. Um, just stay here. Uh, I just just looking back, you know, chapter one, as I I think I said, uh, chapter one uh, in in the in the message last uh, Sunday. If you have listened to that, I was just saying that uh, the preparation for us to get into chapter six, seven, eight, you know, all the way. To chapter twenty two is is preempt pre premised by the beauty of who Jesus is, by his revelation of himself, by by um, uh, talking to the seven churches. You know, I, I mean, first you know, showing himself for who he is with the grandeur of uh, of who is the Son of God. Wherein uh, we we remember John fell fell like us dead seeing Jesus seeing the trumpet sound of his voice, seeing who is for who is that, you know, he was so almost, he has fallen dead uh, on his face because of the power probably and the uh, the beauty that, you know, cannot, he, his, his, if, even, even when he's up there in heaven, you know, in that atmosphere of, of the presence of God, I mean, uh, well, no. In in chapter one, he wasn't there, but in the presence of Jesus, I mean, it was it was just so so powerful that you know his his physicality could not even contain the beauty, the wonder, the majesty, the revelation of who Jesus is. I mean, um, uh, the sound, the light that was coming coming uh, through him that he fell dead and. Uh, Jesus had to pick him up, had to touch him and, and, and lay his hands on him to, to be revived and to get some of that life that was released through Jesus. And uh, we see a, a description of who he is, Jesus. And, and then after that, after that revelation, I mean, he brought us into chapter 2 and 3 and talked to us about the seven churches. And uh, very, very powerful that uh, chapter one is all a revelation of who he is. And then talking about his bride, talking about uh, his, his people, talking about the uh, redeemed, talking about the forgiven, the forgiven community that is now, you know, uh, representing him on earth. Seven categories, seven different, you know, um, uh, uh character and characteristics and so on and so forth and we saw him you know he commended he he corrected he he advised and 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 so on and so forth and then uh to be and then after this after this uh we be, we, we see that chapter four is again an invitation so it's like a book end you know i mean god is insulating us and helping us to be so uh uh so surrounded 
by the power, the, the majesty, the beauty of who Jesus is, what heaven is all about, what the Father is all about, what, how, what, what kind of power is in the royal court of God, what kind of attitude do they have, what kind of posture do they do, they do, uh, the, the, do they practice every day, what kind of, um, uh, you know, the, the majesty of the royal court is is. I don't know. I have no words to describe. Of course, we're reading it right now. I mean, uh, and and of course, then chapter five, you know, the advent of Jesus being qualified, the only one qualified, the only one righteous, the only one who has uh, the right uh, to take the scroll and read it and preempt and begin, uh, you know, um, uh, the judgment, which is going to be chapter six and seven and eight and so on and so forth, until, you know, we get into the end of it. But uh, next, next, uh, Angelo. So Revelation 4, we see, uh, gives us the most detailed description of God's beauty. So Jesus showed us his most, you know, his, his description of who he is, revelation of who he is, uh, to, to help us, you know, be encouraged, to help us to rely and, and trust his leadership, and then showing us the Father, the God's, uh, the Holy Spirit taking us into chapter 4 to see the court of God, to see the power of God, to see the majesty and, and this beauty. What is this beauty? I think it's, um, uh, is, is to, to help us, you know, because the world is so ugly. Uh, the condition of the earth right now, as we see it, is so ugly. It's so ugly because of sin, because of corruption, because of uh, the darkness, because of the uh, the perversion that you know um, uh, the demonic forces in the world system is really uh, allowing us to see in display. But in, in Revelation four, God is showing us that you know here, here Linda, I mean come up here, John, uh, and and see. Uh, that it doesn't matter the ugliness of the world, the ugliness of your atmosphere, the ugliness of your circumstances of the earth right now. A bee come up here and take a look at how beautiful I am, how beautiful my goodness is, how beautiful my kindness is, and express it in colors and sounds and, and, and trumpets and, and just pulsing life and just the beauty of the presence of God. So that this chapter is uh, the beauty realm of God. We refer to that as uh, the beauty realm of God. And, you know, I like you probably, but you probably are better than me. I mean, I, I still am going back to this. I really want to see this beauty because I believe this beauty, seeing the beauty of God, seeing the power of God, seeing the court of God, seeing the attitude of those in front of his throne allows us to get another dimension of revelation. It, it, this, this one strengthens us, emboldens us, and equips us for uh, the next uh, chapter wherein we will see uh, the judgment come. But you see, the wrath of God or the anger of God, the judgment of God is not for you and for me. And we will, we will study that and we will go there. Next, uh, Angelo. So Revelation 5 just, uh, to quickly go there, gives us insight in the Father's plan to exalt Jesus as a human king over the earth. So because he, uh, in chapter 5, we see that Jesus is the only one worthy to take the scroll. He is the only one qualified to read the scroll, open it, and read it, and execute it. All right? And so... Um, the primary theme in the book of Revelation is, of course, Jesus coming back as king to rule the nations. That's why this is a blessed hope. That's why we study this in this manner and in this way. And we don't want to just brush it off and just, you know, gloss it over. Uh, we really want to dive deep into it. We really want to get a revelation. We really want the Holy Spirit to really help us, you know, be amazed, be wowed by who God is. I mean, I mean that's not even a word that we can ever ever use really to describe that wow factor of God. Uh but but you know sufficient for us for now to 
to just, you know, um, allow ourselves to be amazed, be awed. And that's why, you know, I believe that after studying Revelation for where the Holy Spirit is going to take us, uh, we will not, you know, we will continue. It will really spur us to walk in the fear of God, in the appreciation of God, in a gratefulness for God and, and what he's doing. That's why Revelation, in the way that we're studying it, is, is emboldening us, giving us that strength, giving us the courage giving us the trust so that, you know, when persecution comes, when the difficult uh, things comes, because they will come, I mean, we will remember how beautiful. We will be insulated by the beauty of God. We will be surrounded by that, you know, uh, seeing in the spirit realm and strengthening in our inner man of who God is and, and, and that Jesus is already qualified and worthy to take the scroll because of what he has done on the cross so the cross uh though he said he declared it is finished it is continually being executed to its total fulfillment until he returns all right but it gave us the access to see this get a revelation of who god is get a revelation of what is going on in heaven and uh, the invitation is really for us to to see God wants to reveal to us, uh, then to John and the, the people, you know, who got it in his time. But for us today, God is giving us a revelation of what's to come. What's to come. It's a preparation for to see what's coming, what's coming up. And uh, of course, you know, you, I'm sure you already read what chapter six is all about and seven. And you begin to see uh, the, the execution of the judgment going forward. Yeah. But God here is uh, already helping us to be amazed at who he is. So we will be a uh, uh, we, this is the antidote of being fearful and afraid and, and, and anxious, you know, or, you know, terrified for what is to, to come. We're already, you know, looking at heaven. This is our destination. The place where God is, the presence of God is, is our destination. Next. So we see God's vast, majestic resources. I mean, uh, what do you see there? You see, you know, all of those precious gems. Um, there was one time when I was just, uh, when Jesus was saying in John, was it in John 14, you know, I prepare a place for you. And then uh, you begin to see that, you know, I'm sure the, uh, I don't know what, where I read it or maybe I, I taught it that, you know, um, this, this house is that this dwelling place that God is building for us. Um, uh, it's, it's a place where, you know, it's it's so amazingly decorated by all the gems that, you know, we we are so amazed at on earth. It's just, it's just you know, the, it's just a decoration for the buildings and uh, and so on. And, and the street of gold is just, you know, a pavement that, that we, every creature in heaven would walk walk through and yet you know we are amazed at the the gold that uh, uh, some people kill for it so but here um uh, god's vast uh, majestic resources is being revealed to us in revelation 4 so that when the time comes when uh, this antichrist person is given the authority and the power to really execute his evil in the world uh, and 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 you know part of that will be preventing people from uh, from doing a uh, uh, transaction business and, and you know like uh, they said that you may not be able to uh, without the mark of the beast you cannot buy and sell stuff etc cetera, etc cetera. no uh, you, you you have in your mind you have in your consciousness you have in your face this this that God has revealed to us in chapter 4 a vast majestic resources and uh uh and he's committing uh, all of this uh establishing his plan for Jesus so you know we we will hear uh, our prayer and our goal is to 
continue to trust the leadership of Jesus. He knows exactly what he's doing. The government of God in heaven, the court of God in heaven has already planned all of these things from the be uh, from the ending to the beginning. And so, you know, what I would like for us to gain here before we get to chapter six and so and the, all the other chapters after for next year that we be emboldened, we be strengthened, we be confident in the leadership of Jesus and the plan of God. Next. So in the Father's heavenly court, this is what we see in Revelation 4. Uh, it outlines four categories of God's beauty, each with three themes. Take a look. In the spirit, well, you know, we'll read this again. I was in the spirit and behold the throne set in heaven. One sat on the throne. You know, these are the descriptions. He who sat there was like was like a jasper and a side stone in appearance. I mean, fiery and brightly. And there was a rainbow around the throne uh, like emerald. You know, I, I know an emerald is very expensive, but to, to see that, you know, around the throne of God. So around the throne were 24 elders. So these are the inhabitants of, of the court of God, were the, in the presence of God. Next. So we see the beauty of God's person in Revelation 4, 3. God, how he looks. He's, he's, go he's beyond gorgeous. He's beyond amazing. You know, he's beyond majestic. How he feels and how he acts. We see it there. And then number two, the beauty of God's partners. That's you. That's the church. That's the bride. Uh, you see them in the personification of the 24 elders, uh, enthroned, robed, and crowned. All right. And number three, the beauty of God's power, manifestation of power in lightning. I mean, I don't know. I mean, we see lightning here on earth, but I don't think it even, you know, you can even compare that and use that as an example uh, with regards to the manifestation of God's power. Uh, demonstrated in lightning, thunder, and voices in heaven. They're, they're, I think they're so loud, and yet they're, they're not, they're not uh, noisy, but they have such a profound life. I don't know what kind of life is in heaven, but I, it's not the same as the life that we know know it on earth. It's going to be so powerful. It is eternity. It is, it is. It is a life that is that is of God, and there's no comparison. All right, next to earth. And number four is the beauty of God's presence. It's fiery, it's bright, it's like it's like jewels. It's it's just so hard to explain from our contemporary mindset. Uh, and then you have the lamps. You have the seraphim, and then you have the sea of glass, right? So we also see that in Revelation 4, 8 to 11, we see that, yeah, like I said earlier, governmental leaders of heaven worship God and declare his transcendent beauty. Actually, that's, that's how we should see the throne of God and what surrounds the throne of God. It's a transcendent beauty. Another word that, people use this otherly otherly place otherly kind of life or otherly you know kind of atmosphere uh, and all this they glory or boast with the light in God as they honor and thank him and uh, next so notice here their foundational hymn forever is to magnify God's holiness I mean, 24-7, they go, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, and is to come. I mean, over and over and over again. I mean, you and I, you know, at times we feel like we're already bored, you know, <laughs> with our worship one hour. I mean, one hour uh, worshiping God in songs and hymns and prayers. I mean, sometimes we already, okay, 
Look at our watch. Um, it's already one hour. We're still worshiping. And this is forever and ever. Like uh, the Amplify says, eternities of eternities. <laughs> I mean, what is that? So there are 14 hymns in Revelation. We will look at that another time. To be holy means uh, to be totally separated from. In other words, his, his otherly, his is so different from anything you've ever seen ever, ever before. Different from us, separated. In other words, he's a total, he's a class of, of his own. Everything separated from everything sinful, worldly, fleshly, dark, you know, evil, demonic. So thus he is pure. I wonder what that is. And that is also our goal, you know. I uh, This just reminds us of uh, uh, Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Really, because God is so separate from all of these sinful natures, all of this... Uh, uh, you know, perverted uh, atmosphere on earth and on people that we, you know, he, he's so pure. So he requires purity from us as well to see him. Do you guys wonder why? Well, I, you know, a lot of people say I see God or I hear God, but sometimes I kind of, I'm concerned because, you know, it takes, it takes purity of heart and of lifestyle to really see God. And I wonder how we would be if, if he really shows himself to us. Because I saw John, John almost, almost, was almost dead. Daniel's in Daniel 9, almost, almost dead. You know, I mean, he was so, every life in him was sucked out because of the presence of God. And of course, you know, we have experienced falling under the power of God. But that's nothing, I believe, when we really, 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 really see. When God really, 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 really appeared before us, we will be like that. Our constituency, uh, our, you know, constitution, our physical constitution will probably just, you know, be sapped out. So God is separated from everything created because he is so separate. He is so unique on his own. He's so God. He's so different. That's, he is transcendent or infinitely superior to all that exists. God's holiness points to his transcendent beauty. How is that? How magnificent is that? I don't think we really have uh, in our English language or any language, anything, um, I don't know, maybe in Hebrew, to really, you know, even... Uh, define what the transcendent beauty of God is all about. All right, next, Angelo. Is that it? Okay. So God's throne, the perfection of beauty. This is, we will just go quickly here. Um, the beauty realm of God, Revelation 4 and 5, like we said, describes what our beautiful God put around his throne to ex uh, express his beauty. His royal court is a place of perfect beauty uh, the government of god is perfect and it's beautiful you know think of that i mean we don't know of any government on earth that is even perfect and never mind beautiful they're all ugly <laughs> in in the way they run the government they take leadership but here this is what you know i want us i want our hearts to see the perfection of beauty I mean, everything uh, that is God is beautiful. His love is beautiful. His kindness is beautiful. His mercy is beautiful. You know, all of his attribute is beautiful. His eyes, when they look at us, is beautiful. His voice is beautiful, powerful, majestic. Amen. So next. So here we see this in Psalm 119, verse 96. God's beauty is seen 
in his royal court, which is adorned with, you know, the adornment in the court of God's seraphim. These are angelic creatures, cherubim, elders, saints, and angels, fire, winds, music, fragrances flow across the crystal sea of glass. And I have seen the consummation of all perfection, beauty, and majesty. I mean, just, just beautiful. <laughs> Next. So again here, I say uh, uh, Psalm 50 verse 2, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. That's why, you know, uh, uh, Jerusalem is going to be very, very important, especially when he returns, because it will be a place of beauty. It will be a throne of beauty. It will be a government of beauty wherein uh, Jesus will rule and reign. Uh, Psalm 27 verse 4, honor and majesty are before him. Uh, that's that's how that, that throne is. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Where do you find the beauty of God? In his sanctuary. That's why you and I, we approach coming even to church. When we gather together, we know that uh, the Bible says to us that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am. And so it is so important that we come together, whether it's in a building, as a church, or with which, you know, when we are gathering and we are uh, intending ourselves to come uh, to worship and to 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 honor God, uh, it, it becomes a sanctuary, it becomes a place of holiness, becomes a place separated, you know, from all other places, uh, just uh, attributed and given to God. And so uh, you see it in Psalm 27, 4, one thing, I mean, possibly... Uh, David must have seen the beauty, some, some degree of God's beauty and God's perfection of beauty. Because here in Psalm 27, in the midst of a lot of trouble in his life, I mean, he had this one decision. He, he decided he would be this one thing person because he saw something majestic. He saw something that uh, life was well, life altering for him. Uh, I have desired all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. That, that must be transforming. That must be something that, you know, just that changes you from, uh, you know, desiring this worldly uh, beauty uh, as opposed to, you know, seeing, beholding the beauty of the Lord. I mean, uh, yeah. So Revelation 4 is one of the greatest passages on God's beauty. And it describes the Father's throne. We look at that already. All right, next. Let's very quickly. So four main categories, which again, here, we already looked at it earlier. The beauty of God's person, the beauty of God's partners. We are beautiful as a church when we walk in the beauty of God. I mean, the beauty of God's power, God's power, God's thunder, God's voices, God's trumpets uh, is beautiful and the beauty of God's presence is reflected in fire, lamps, seraphim, and the sea. Next. So here we, be, we see what is this? What is the beauty of God? How does God look, feel, and act? Uh, glorious light filled with various colors radiate from God's presence, including the brightness of diamonds, which is also called jasper. Fiery red glo uh, glory, which is also called sarges, and the various colors of the emerald rainbow, which, you know, the jasper speaks of his splendor, sarges his fiery desires, and the emerald rainbow his mercy. So we see that, you know, the rainbow, uh, the emerald that's the uh, rainbow that surrounds his throne is mercy. Wow. That's why the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Why? His mercies never comes to an end. They're new every morning because great is, uh, great is his mercy. So, yeah, we see here again. No, keep going. Like Jasper Stone, I mean, very, you know, you already read this. Uh, it's diamond-like crystal. It, it's such brilliance that radiates from God's throne. I wonder what that is, how that is. So, you know, we we will see this again in Revelation 21, 11, 
the new Jerusalem will uh, with the light that was like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. I mean, all of this diamond-like brilliance, radiating light, uh, and and uh, oh, like like precious stones are so ethereal as far as I'm concerned, and I have no description really uh, to to give justice to this uh, on the earth. So God dwells in light. We, he is light. He spoke light that no one can approach, not due to his desire to distance himself. Relationally, I believe that his light protects his creation from the fullness of his glory. You remember in, in Genesis, I mean, he had to, to, uh, to kick uh, Adam and Eve out of the garden. Why? Because his presence is in the garden. And for as long as they're there in that sinful nature, I mean, God will be able, you know, they will be killed by the presence of the glory of God. All right. And so we notice, like I alluded to this last Sunday, that um, uh, we are looking at a, a huge shift in the uh, in the way that the church is going to be, there's going to be a revival and a and a changing of uh, uh, the the expression and the nature uh, of of the church. And um, then I was looking; we were looking at Acts, you know, in Acts five, that when the glory, the great glory, and the great presence of God is present, you don't want to lie like uh, what's. Uh, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, was it? Yeah, Ananias and Sapphira did. They lied to the Holy Ghost and they they died. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, God is very careful to distance himself, not because he doesn't like us, but, you know, uh, be but because his really real presence is going to kill our uh, natural, natural um, physicality. But and so you know, uh, I believe that his light protects his creation from the fullness of his glory. So he gives us trickles, a little bit of his presence, and so on and so forth. And and that's why you know, I mean, you you gotta enter pure into his presence so that we don't die. All right. First uh, Timothy six sixteen tells us that his dwelling place is unapproachable light. Whom no man can see or can uh, can has seen or can see. I mean, totally, he has to do something. Like remember in Moses's time when he said, "I want to see your glory," and God says, "Okay, I'll show you my goodness. I will show you my behind, my back part, and I will uh, let you come to the cleft of the rock uh, to protect you from uh, the the powerful release of His glory." Are you guys listening to me? I mean, you know, really, I, I, I'm praying that, you know, from today on, we will not take the presence of God for granted. Because I know a lot of merchandising uh, has been happening in the body of Christ. People say, oh, you know, the presence of God, the presence of God. But you know when, the pres when God is present. I mean, you almost can't do anything. You, you are just, mm, just. The power of God just overwhelms you. Next. Seraphim covered their faces, being overwhelmed with his glory. You know, Isaiah 6 to 3, we see this with, uh, with uh, Isaiah, that uh, uh, all of this uh, seraphim, each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. One cried to the to another and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And so the narrative of his Isaiah is that I, I'm undone. I saw myself as dirty, as just unfit to come into the presence of God. And God has to do something. An angel was instructed to, you know, uh, get a, uh, get a, a burning coal from the altar and touch his lips so that he may be his lips, uh, his mouth may be cleansed and purified so that he may be able to uh, carry on. So he, you know, the cleansed mouth will be able to be a mess, uh, uh, will allow him to be a messenger because next thing is, whom are we going to send? And he made, you know, the, he volunteered himself, send me. Here I am, send me. Now he's qualified to be sent because of 
what has happened to him in the presence of holy god and and so whenever we come when if we we are when we are in the presence of god definitely there's got to be a change there's got to be a transformation uh you know in our midst and that's why we press on we we desire that when you know when we're studying individually in our own places in our own secret place i mean we're transformed right there when the presence of god comes to you when we come together as a corporate body the the dynamics of the presence of god comes to us and and you will need to be changed this is always my cry that we need to be changed we cannot just be studious we cannot just be scots we need to really you know the word penetrates us and it, you know word is alive sharper active sharper than any two edged sword able to divide i mean there's a transformation happening in the midst of us next without protection god's creation is overwhelmed at the fullness of god's glory so god is really you know protecting us from being destroyed meanwhile we're you know we're we're journeying towards you know uh uh purity we're journeying towards godliness we're journeying towards you know really understanding how uh we should be um, understanding actually the power that is already within us so here revelation 10 11 the kings of the earth hid themselves and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne i mean you know the song of uh, david binion and nicole i mean there's there's the word that says uh, seeing this terry his terrifying beauty his beauty is terrifying because of the intensity of that beauty we've never seen any beauty like that that almost crosses you that almost just you know uh it's it's like a force that comes to you threatens you and at the same time you know wants to hold you and and this is how in 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 when the judgments are released this is how people are going to be i mean they will be threatened by uh the presence of god and they will want to hide sin will hide sin hides and the presence of God brings destruction uh, and death to uh, a sinful soul. So I saw him who, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Next. Like a sarger stone. What is that? Deep red gem speaks of God's fiery desire, giving us insight. Our soul... Our, our mind, our ability to comprehend this and define what is being said here, you know, in chapter 4 of Revelation. I mean, really, I, what he feels, but he, you know, he's, what he's telling us really is what he feels. God is fiery desire for you and for me, for his church, for to bring restoration, to finally, uh, um, uh, destroy those that continuously and forever resist uh, his love and and his desire to be with them so he burns with desire for you and for me remember his song of songs is i am ravished you know he's, he's so desirous of us he's so burning with desire for me for you for us for his church for his people and he's so desiring that we, burning with desire, that we live in that place where he is. So here, John 59, Jesus is the Lord, your God is a consuming fire. We see this also in Deuteronomy 4, a jealous, passionate God. Uh, the Father who loves me, I also have loved you. I mean, it's so, uh, you know, um, this relationship that we are, supposed to nurture uh to to uh, to develop with god is 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 going you, you you and i we will come into a place and in a time i i really believe quickly lord let 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 us be like fire let us respond to you in a consuming fire as well uh, help us to be jealous of who you are and uh uh, understand that you know, how much you love us, how much Jesus loved us, you know, cost you his life. And, and you're willing to do everything and all things that you can do to rescue us. Next. 
Emerald Rainbow, I mean, speaks of the tender mercies of God. God's covenant mercies cover all the activity of his throne. I mean, his throne is covered with mercy. Emerald Green speaks of life. Vegetation, God's beautiful personality is seen in how he relates to us with great kindness and tenderness. Wow. I mean, his throne is covered with mercy. Next. Think about that when, you know, you feel like you want to let go, you want to quit, you want to be, you yield to destruction, you yield to the lust of the flesh. Think about that, that that is nothing compared to the beauty that surrounds the throne of God, which is mercy. Genesis 9, 13 to 16, I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. You know, during the time of uh, Noah, this is this is the proof. God is, God's mercy uh, is new every morning because great is his faithfulness. All right. You see this in this, Exodus 34, 6, 7. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering. Can you imagine God long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth? If you think you need, uh, you are needing goodness, swim in the river, in the ocean of God's abounding goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands of generations. This is who God is. This is where he's showing us, you can trust me. I am trustworthy. I mean, we know his faithfulness. We know the story of God. But unfortunately, you know, we we don't really, uh, there's still a lot of opportunity for us to be unfaithful. All right. <laughs> you know, I I we have to end there because um, chapter five is going to be a little bit longer. And uh, I'd like to interject in chapter five. You know the the importance uh, the, the importance in the equation in in God's judgment, you and I are very important in that equation. Your prayer, our obedience, everything that we are, we are. You know that's why it's important that we understand that God's not God is sovereign, but He's not just going to do everything. You know He'll do His part, and he, we we have to do our part, and we need to understand our part. And our part right now for me is I want to be amazed at God and let my amazement of the beauty of God transform me, translate me from being enamored of the world to being hateful of the world and its system and be enamored with God. Amen. All right. Anybody want to say something? And then, of course, you guys, you know, and then, you know, last Sunday, I kind of uh, segued into teaching us a little bit of uh, what I was supposed to share with the uh, the Palawan uh, group last uh, last week on, you know, God, the church after God's own heart. And that's just a preamble after it's just an overview. I mean, we will tackle that a little bit more, but... Um, our prayer really is, uh, you know, in studying chapter four and five, well, from chapter one to chapter five, that, that we will be, we will be um, really transformed, that we will be changed. Just like Second Corinthians 3 is saying, as we behold the image of God, we're changed from glory to glory until, you know, uh, until the reflection of our face in the mirror of God has no more distortion. It's it's as it is. And um, uh, this study, uh, the goal of this study is for us to be really, uh, not just be blessed with God, but be in love with Him and really submit ourselves to uh, uh, the beauty of who He is. And, you know, every time I see the beauty of who God is, I mean, I, I have this, you know, dissatisfaction in me that I'm not able to really define that. I don't know about you. Maybe you can define it, but, you know, but I'm still amazed with my earthly understanding 
with a spiritual, you know, anointing to really see the beauty of who God is. But I know one thing uh, for me, my takeaway whenever I go and uh, especially Revelation 4 and 5, uh, my takeaway there is that, you know, I just, God, I, I, I just, I am wowed at who you are. Regardless that my men mental aptitude, my emotional understanding, and my, you know, soul, even my spirit, really, that's why Second First uh, Corinthians 2, 2 kept telling us, you know, that uh, mind, uh, mind has not seen, ears has not heard the things that God has prepared for them that loves him. And so only by the revelation of the Holy Spirit are we going to be able to really comprehend and apprehend what God's beauty and what is he saying to us is really, I mean, see me. And when you see me, you will be ready for what comes next. Because that's really, really the readiness that is bringing us into. We will understand his judgment we will not be offended by the uh, violence that we will see when his judgments is, are released because we know he, he's been patient all these thousands of years, patient with man, patient with us, patient with Israel, patient with his church, in spite of and after, even after Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, all that powerful thing that already belongs to us. Uh, God is continually being faithful so that um, hopefully we will really adhere to him and rely on him as the vital necessity of our life. Amen. All right. Anybody would like to make a comment or? Um, I, I can say something, Pastor. <coughs> Go ahead. Well, uh, of course, when we read and read, uh, and like what we did now, we read and read, uh, as you emphasize, uh, really the beauty of God. Uh, yeah. I'm just amazed or just like, okay, in my finite mind. <laughs> um, All of our we, finite minds. That, that's why our mind is limited to grasp that beauty of God in his magnificence and grandeur, but uh, I'm amazed that he gave us the Holy Spirit to really take hold yeah. of beauty yeah. and yeah. Not, not just overnight, but of course it will be transformed, changed to glory to glory to really understand him. So it's really, um, really his goodness and his, love for us and his pursuit of us that hey understand me <laughs> uh get hold of me get hold but of he me. knows we really cannot fully understand him right but because the, he's god and if we can understand him then he ceases to be god and i well uh also that's why i like thank you for the holy spirit that you yeah. gave us the holy spirit to yeah. help us um a bit to maybe <laughs> get hold no, of that yeah. beauty. I, I, I think we may not be able to verbalize uh, how odd we are uh, as we encounter chapter 4 and 5, but mm -hmm. but we do. I mean, you you have that expression inside of you. You, you, you get it, uh, although you don't get it fully. <laughs> But it will it will manifest in your life, your change life, your change conversation, your way of hearing God and hearing things, and the way you and I would uh, would deal with somebody else, someone else, difficult situation, cruel people. Your you you in your expression, your un, at, I believe that our understanding of the beauty of God will be expressed in that. It will be manifested. We have no definition, maybe the right verbiage to, towards it, but at the way we will act, the way we will see things, the way we will walk in the fear of God will be affected by 
that. I'm, I'm affected by that in that way. You know, very careful to uh, to just walk carelessly and do careless things. Yeah. I have a question, Pastor. Like, um, yeah. you know, at the and uh, when we meet Jesus, uh, can we say we can really get the fullness of Him? By that time when he returns, we will be we will be changed. Our bodies will be changed from mortality to immortality, and therefore you can fully see him. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, I believe we can fully uh, know him. You know, uh, I don't really know how much because hey, I mean, how can you know? Like in Isaiah forty, I mean, the prophet says. God said to him, do, do, do you know that I can, I mean, this is my power, do you know that I can measure the whole uh, heavens with the span of my hand mm -hmm. and I can calculate in my hand from a dust the totality of the earth, you know? I mean, the immeasurable greatness of God is, is so vast. He says, you know, I can, you know, all the, all the, the trees, all the cedars, all in Lebanon is not enough, you know. Uh, he, he, you know, with a drop of water, he can calculate the whole uh, ex expanse of, of sea water on the earth. I mean, this is God. I mean, he, he can just, you know, wave his hand and just. That's why when Jesus was on the cross. The terrifying thing for him really was not the shame, was not the, the torture, was not the crucifixion, was not all of those that man can do. It was the pain of God's eyes turning away from him. That was the terrifying power because that's the terrifying beauty and power uh, that made him, you know, just did what he did doing what he did had to do because of God's watching him, God's eyes upon him, God's presence in him. But when he was on the cross, finally at some point in that crucifixion, God had to turn away from him. And that was the hardest. And so, yeah. I don't know what that is, but I just, I, I feel like, yeah. And so in, in our study, this book, I mean, and, and even, even as we study, I don't know if you notice it, but I, I, I'm sure you do, that there's so much warfare in this study, so much fight. As I'm teaching even tonight, there's so much fight coming against me. You know, I've got things that I, I, I can say, but, you know, I'm, I'm really just uh, prevented. But hey, just keep going. We just keep going. <laughs> we just override the warfare <laughs> and so on. Amen. Okay. How about anybody else would like to say something or ask question? And I may not be able to answer it, but I'm, you know, we'll uh, try it. Um, I think Sister Lilita, Pastor Lilita, is mentioned about the Holy Spirit, right? That um, we thank God because uh, the Holy Spirit really give us an understanding. Um, uh, although we need more understanding of the revelation, but one thing that I, that touched me when I was listening for Dalton Thomas mm -hmm. is um, he said that a billion years from now we are not be fascinated with the end times, although we really oh, want yeah, to know yeah. what the end times, which is we really know. But one thing is the you know uh, he said that we are gonna be uh, fascinated with the mm -hmm. one on the throne yeah. Yeah. and the one who is worthy to take this the, the, the scroll mm -hmm. yeah. and another thing that he was saying is just like uh what we believe in what we feel what we see about him uh is the most important thing in this time that we are in and he also said that it's not worth it uh to study the book of Revelation revelation to just study the end time events but it uh, because it can feed uh, our our spirit it can feed uh, or it cannot 
conform us, he said, um, into the image of, of Jesus. Uh -huh. But, you know, it's um, the reality that we need is to really know the knowledge of God, of who he is, um, who sit on the throne and that his intention is it? I mean, yeah. God's intention for us to understand it. To have a right view of God is going to be yeah. very key. In our study, we're not loving studying the end times, but we are. We need to understand the end times and to to study it for the purpose of partnering mm -hmm. with 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 God and being, allowing the Holy Spirit to take leadership over us. And but the goal is to see who Jesus is, to see who God is. Because unless you see him, you know, you're just, you're just blind. And that's why, yeah, Dalton was saying that. And, you know, he's saying it's not, you know, when Jesus returns, we're not going to be fascinated with uh, a revelation. I mean, uh, uh, end time study, but we need the study for an understanding. For understanding and and yeah, like you know, like I keep saying, the seven spirits of God is going to be massively manifesting in the midst of us, and so the importance of really contending always to be led by the Spirit of God is you know exercise that now, come under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, stop going in our own you know uh, the way of our flesh, the way of our desire. Let that be curved, you know. That's why fasting and praying is going to really help us subdue uh, our our fleshly desires. Because for as long as and until we are not freed from the the persuasion of the world system and the fleshly desire, uh, it's going to be very hard to really uh, position ourselves into walking in the fear of God. Because, you know, uh, yeah. And so part of uh, what is happening to us in this study is, uh, you know, we become, hopefully we're becoming a people of one thing. <laughs> because all, in all of this, you know, uh, in all of this study, we, we, we continue to see God just wanting to dwell with us. His, his ache continually is that I may be, I may dwell with you, that I may be your God and you may be my people, you know, over and over. I mean, if you go back to the, the cry of the bride post, uh, you will see that in the beginning. I kept, you know, I, I kept that, I kept that. And I kept that in my heart that, you know, if I think I want to be in the presence of God, no, God wants to be present with us. And in us, he wants to dwell with us. And that is going to be all of this fight, all of this contending, all of this pressure that we are experiencing is because heaven is fighting for us. Heaven is fighting for the restoration of all of his creation because there's so much more that belongs to us that we were robbed of because of sin, because of sinfulness, because of what's going on on the earth. But soon, soon and very soon, that is going to change. Our, our concept, our, our perspective is going to be revolutionized uh, once and for all when Jesus returns. And so, you know, right now, the, it, it, it's, it's a fight. That's why I keep saying to us, you know, let's not just be students. Let's not be stu studios, scolazzo, but let us be, uh, get, get the revelation, get the transformative power of God in our midst as we study. I mean, he's revealing himself to us and then to every one of us, it will be different. You know, the level, the degree is going to be different, but press on to get the most that you can get. Dream of the throne, dream of the beauty of God, dream of the, the church that Jesus is building, and it is a church after his own heart. Just just dream of this, desire this, fight for it, you know, to the nail. This is so worth the fight, you know, and and fight with aim, fight to target you know the opponent and, and see what is still, you know, um. What kind of doors are still open in your lives? What kind of agreement 
do you still have with the world and its system and, and get free from it? And, and I'm praying that this study is going to do that because the next chapter is going to be terrifying if you're not convinced that, you know, Jesus' leadership is going to be more than enough for all of us. You know, um, like I say, you know, there's not enough verbiage, not enough words to really describe that. But, you know, you... I don't know about you, but I think you know that you know your your spiritual capacity is starting to enlarge. Uh, your spiritual ability is starting to be activated. Uh, you are motivated by something that is so over and above, you know, our natural reach, but is being made available to us and for us because it has been paid for by Him who sits on the throne on the right-hand side of God. And he, the, he, he is coming back because I paid for you and I, I, you belong to me and you're entitled to, uh, to the best that God has prepared for us. I mean, you know, you don't have to go back. I mean, Revelation is really, I mean, we see what Revelation is fighting for, what is Re Revelation being revealed to us by just going to Genesis 1. God prepared everything for us before he created us. The suitability of our environment, the suitability of the, of the, the wealth of what we are to experience, uh, the, the power, the dominion, the rights, the authority, the privileges, it was so overwhelmingly available for us and yet with this own you know we we deprived ourselves of that beauty it was not our fault uh, because we did not have a man did not have an experience of sin but it was the uh, cre creatures you know that brought that sin to us but jesus already came to really pay the price that's why it is sad that is you know the Jews have not received him the first time, but thank God is also looking forward to him coming back the second time, and hopefully you know you know they don't forfeit that 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 second time. But I I think he will not for they they will not forfeit the second time because you and I were responsible. You and I we are here to to make him them so envious and so jealous of our relationship with God that they will run to God. They will say, why? I mean, he is, <laughs> uh, we're first and so on and so forth. You know, the fullness of the Gentile has to come first. And I think, uh, I think we're going to get there. I think the grace of God is really going to be, you know, manifest in the midst of us. And so our individual um, lifestyle, our individual, you know, cultivation of our relationship with God, leadership of the Holy Spirit, loving the Word, and really just living the Word, believing what, you know, living what we believe is going to be very important. Because a right view, one of the things that Dalton was, you know, is the right view of God. Because a lot of churches, a lot of believers do not have a right view of God. And so that's our prayer. But, uh, you know, if you look at the, the big things of what's going on in the church, it is going to be so easy to be discouraged. But remember, the only reason we are a bride is because we have a bridegroom that we behold. And so, you know, we begin to see our bridegroom, king, and judge, and the reflection of his beauty and the reflection of who he is comes to us and we get formed into that bridal, you know, uh, identity to which we cry, Maranatha. All right. Okay. Uh, anybody else? One more person and then go ahead, Grace. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was I was just looking at this one one phrase come up higher and it yeah opens. I'm telling so you yeah things, yes. me too I'm I'm done with just that one yeah just with that it has <laughs> a, a lot of things staring in me yeah 
So come up higher. So it's an invitation, higher. Where is that higher? Of course, we, we know it's in the heavenly realm. Yes. The third heavens, mm -hmm. right? The third heavens. The third heaven, yeah. Yeah, the third heaven. So we know heaven is vast. It was, and we we know that you can go to many, many places in heaven. You know, testimonies of those who have died. Oh, I've yeah. seen my palace, beautiful mountains, you know, the streets of gold. But this is specific invitation for us in this third realm. Okay, is specifically the throne room. Yeah, that's what it was. It was in no other place. It's just in the throne room. Yeah, it's not in the peripherals. It is in the central. Yeah. The central, the throne room. Come yes. up in the throne room so I can unveil myself to, to you. you. Just I mean, I'll unveil myself to you. So it means that the unveiling of God, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of the government of heaven is in the throne the room. Okay. That's why you, 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 know, you were emphasizing that it, it, it's vital. It's a, it's a vital study. Mm -hmm. And then, how did he get through that through that throne room? I was, I mean, that was just because of our last discussion. You John, know, John, yeah, uh, uh, last <laughs> Thursday. How do you enter through that throne mm -hmm. room? And says there that he entered into this uh, this other realm, entered into third heaven into a particular door. There's a particular door to the throne room. Mm -hmm. So if time tells, I'll, I'll, I'll share the door a little while. But when he entered that door, his environment changed. His environment changed. His focus changed. Mm -hmm. okay. Revelation 2 to 3 the focus was sin and the churches. I think you also made mention that, you know, uh, earlier uh, that, uh, it, you know, Jesus was, was making commendations and then the rebukes mm -hmm. and the warnings. And the, so that's Revelation 2 and 3. But now when he entered the throne room, his entire focus changed to the throne of God and the glory of God. Yeah. So, so of course, you know, like like I, I I was saying, sometimes it's very hard to verbalize things called yes. <laughs> so, by the spirit. So forgive me if I have gaps. So um so I realized that the throne room, which is set in heaven, it's already set in heaven, right? Is about his authority, his power, and the dominion of the spirit, the dominion mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit. That's the government. That's, yeah. Uh, so that's all. That's all that is there. So this three embodies the government of God or the government in heaven. Mm -hmm. So um, the throne and the glory is operating on earth through us. Yeah. We, you see? Yeah. yeah. So these are just uh, statements because I know time is short. So the throne um, and the glory is operating here on earth through me. Mm -hmm. That's why, that's the very re reason of my existence. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of my partnership with Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, That's what and he paid for. Exactly. He died for, yeah. So uh, focus, change of environment. So I said, Lord, I'm living in Babylon. But when my focus is on the throne room, your transcendent beauty and then I see your governance, then everything deems in my Babylonian environment. Mm -hmm. So 
we say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens through, through yeah, to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, many scriptures now changes, yeah, not changes, I mean, it, 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 the perspective of seeing it changes. Even I was looking at Genesis 1, 26, when Jesus said, let us make mm -hmm. him in our image. So it means, Lord, when you decided to make me, okay, the counsel of that was in the throne room, Father, mm -hmm. Son, Father Holy God, Spirit. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So since the throne room is just full of your beauty and mercy, so it means I am made out of that substance. Yeah. Image likeness. Yeah, in, because I'm made in the image of his likeness. Because, of course, before we said, you know, he's, he's, too, he's too, too much to be like me. You know, sometimes it's it's like that. Now it's easier to receive it by faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can find ourselves forgiving more and yeah. loving more. Yeah. We can find ourselves to be more confident now, bold, more patient, more bold, more, more courageous, yeah. because our focus had changed. I mean, and it's not that you're doing it; something supernatural happened. And that's why when 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 Pastor Vier was saying, you know, when he he was the one exhorting, and I couldn't feel his tears. I said, I can relate with you. Mm -hmm. Doing my assignment with tears, and then I go into worship, and that happened also last last Tuesday when mm -hmm. we were in our corporate prayer. And I know if 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 Doc is not off cam, and all I see is the chair, I know she's already prostrate on the floor. Mm -hmm. And then here comes Pastor Rafi. See him, you know, take his handkerchief in tears, and then after we're done, he's sharing. He couldn't even speak. Mm -hmm. He was crying. So there's, there, there's a beauty in the throne room when you see your... Uh, you know, like Pastor Afka, I hope you don't mind if I just chase it. He was crying because he said, Lord, forgive me. I didn't see mm -hmm. your worthiness. And now I see your worthiness. So it's just, there's just that repentance and, and things. So I said, so um, the, the, I, I just jumped. I don't want to take so much time. So this door... I, I want to go to the door because the door is 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 important for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh and also I think uh Pastor Ted also spoke about that. I mean, how how and then some asked how do we go through that door? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I I dug a little further into it. So it means that a door is opened for you and I, it speaks of an entrance. Mm -hmm. Granted into a realm beyond mm -hmm. the physical. Mm -hmm. so I, uh, earlier, Pasora, you were saying it's something unfathomable, but you know that something, some transformation is mm -hmm. happening within mm -hmm. you, within me, within us. So in Greek, that door means portal or an entrance is opened unto us. That's why we never pray or ask or cry out, Lord, open the doors of heaven or the portals. It's open. Through, because of Jesus Christ, it's mm -hmm. open. Mm -hmm. You know, it's open for, for, for those that have a relationship with the Lord. But many don't know how to go through that. Mm -hmm. So it says there, um, uh, the portal um, is the invitation of the Father by the Spirit, okay, um, by the Spirit, for upon seeing the door, John immediately became in the Spirit. Mm -hmm. As he so entered he, the door. Yeah, so he, he took the invitation, mm -hmm. entered to the door. The moment he entered that door, you know, he became a Spirit. Mm -hmm. 
uh, were familiar with being led by the spirit, walk by the spirit, you know, everything. So this, I think, happens with us that when we are like and we are studying, we're not studying just because we are going to write something, you know. To, no, I think that we have gone past that. Um, and sometimes what we experience while we'll be studying, you know, like me, it, it, I, it's hard to articulate, it's hard to write mm -hmm. um, in it because it's still being processed by the spirit. Mm -hmm. So it, it says there, he became a spirit. So it means when by faith we are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and where the blood is, the spirit follows um that 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 never that principle never was erased in mm -hmm. me and so i would say lord i am bought by the blood so the spirit is here with me so you will open my eyes you'll make me mm -hmm. see things holy spirit and then immediately uh i am in the flesh but we i see we see beyond you know we see beyond what we are just reading. So I mean, the the, the black and white in uh, in our Bibles, okay, or or even what we are hearing in the videos, uh, changes. It it, it 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 I don't know how to explain it, but it just becomes alive. Um, yeah. so the door is the spirit of Christ and the spirit of sonship. And it opens the gateway into the throne room of the Father. Mm -hmm. So these are the two things. We are only able to enter by faith through the door, to the portal that is open, to enter the throne room of God. Mm -hmm. You see everything that John saw, not physically, but in the heart, in our heart, the spirit of mm -hmm. our eyes. Through the spirit of Christ, mm -hmm. okay, and through the spirit of sonship. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So um, I think Brother Dave was saying that how, how how are we able to share this when we're evangelizing? I mean, this is not uh, for mm -hmm. evangelization, you know, because it's hard to explain. But it, it sonship has to be taught. I'm sure you have been taught uh, well on sonship. Because that has to be established, number one, because the spirit of sonship um, and the spirit of Christ, in other words, one spirit, the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit, is the only one that could escort us into that realm of the throne. Mm -hmm. And so um, it says we need to rise into a new realm to really understand the government of God because everything centers around his throne with the lamp at the center. So, so even understanding the redemption work of Jesus, mm -hmm. recognizing the redemption work of Jesus is so vital. And so, um, yeah, so when, when Jesus says in, in, in Genesis, I look at it back again. And it says there, um, let us make man into mm -hmm. our own image. I, I, I said, Lord, I, I, I kind of understand it in, 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 in a new way. And when you said you take dominion, you know, over everything here on earth. Um, it's, uh, I can't remember where in the Psalms, but it says there that the heavens belongs to the Lord, but and the earth, earth belongs, to belongs, you know, to us. So in other words, there's his government, but through us, mm -hmm. the government of heaven is operating for us to operate it here on earth. So, so many things I... <laughs> you know, I kind of understand better, and and uh, by just seeing that throne room, just this Revelation four and and of course five uh, yeah, coming. We're gonna go to yeah, five next, yeah. Yes. But being yeah. here with Revelation four. But let me oh. let me share with you what triggered an open door. Mm. And you see, because what was when we studied is we. 
remember all of the chapters are connected mm -hmm. that's why the importance of chapter one the revelation of who Jesus is. And then, of course, he started talking about his people, his redeemed, his bride. But in chapter 3, verse 7, after, you know, all of this conversation with the Laodicean church, it says there, Behold, I stand at the door. Jesus stands at the door. And of of the church, really, or of our individual hearts. And continually knock. So if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. So that is the premise. Because after this, you know, I mean, look look at the conversation here. Uh, would you put that on the screen? Because it's very key. Because it's a continuation, remember? This revelation is is not, you know, written. It was not re a revelation of chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. It's a continuous conversation, a continuous, you know, uh, vision that uh, God showed uh, John. So take me there in the Amplified Version. Revelation chapter 3, verse uh, 20. So, behold, I stand. This is Jesus talking. Remember after the conversation with the, uh, the La Laodicean people, uh, after his uh, commendation, after his, uh, no, actually no commendation, but after his counsel, he judged and then he counsel. Behold, I stand at the door. So he's the key here that stands at the door and then he's knocking. He's knocking at your heart. He's knocking at my heart. He's knocking at the heart of the church. So, and, and then the premise is if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, you and I, we open the door. And, and, and the promise is I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. That's kind of, this is a powerful union. Next. Uh, he who overcomes, again, you know, emphasizing this is victorious and I will grant him to sit beside me on my throne. This is the promise to Laodicea. I, you know, this is really amazing. As I myself overcame, was victorious and sat down beside my father on his throne. Okay, location, proximity. Next. He who is able to hear, let him hear. Let him listen to and heed what the Holy Spirit says to the assemblies. Next. After this, I looked. After I opened my heart, I looked and behold, from, from where Jesus was standing at the door of the heart of the church or at the door of the heart of people, I mean, when, once you open your heart to God, then another door where he stands opens up and that's up here in heaven. And so that now becomes, you know, an ethereal place. Um, I know we, we know because of teachings and so on and so forth that heaven is a place and I believe it's a physical place, but I believe heaven is wherever God is. And wherever Father God is, that's where his throne is, that's where his government is, that's where all of these things that are beyond our, our grasp are existing and so the importance of us really walking in the spirit is the only way for us to enter that place where he is and that's why you know uh the the requirement walk in the spirit walk in the spirit what where is that that's walking in faith that's walking in an understanding of uh, what god is doing walking there uh, because, like you say, you know, you you live in Babylon, you live on this earth. I mean, you 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 notice uh, one of the things that mesmerizes me and really just overwhelms me is the thought of Daniel living all of his, you know, young younghood life and his adulthood life in Babylon and ruling and having government in Babylon and not sin. You know, 
And what's the key there? I really believe he walked in the spirit of God. He walked in, in the ways of God. He walked in, you know, the purposes of God. It did not matter. He was not intimidated by big government, big, big emperors, big, uh, big people around him. He actually, you know, they, they kind of are amazed at who he is because he walked in the spirit. And I know, uh, what is walking in the spirit? I mean, is it in who, who praying all the time? Yes, that's part of it. But really, it's walking in that realm where we look to God. And I, I think that that's when doors are open. But it is that that open door is 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 the well, Jesus is the door. He told us in John ten that I am the door. He who enters me shall go in and out and shall find pasture. And so he's really our open. He's our door. He is. We enter through him because after talking to the seven churches, after saying all of these things that he said. And then after saying that, you know, now here I am, I'm knocking at the door, a picture of uh, uh, that if the church will let him enter into their individual lives and corporate life after this, you know, I mean, behold a door standing open in heaven. Very, very connected. You know, it's connected. You, you open your heart to God, you have an open heaven. That door opens for you. Uh, the door opens for all of us and an invitation to come up here. I mean, that's really the goal of God to always come up here. And that's why, you know, it's, it's the fight is the flesh fights our walk in the spirit. And that's why uh, the entrapment of the enemy is to make us just religious, religious people, uh, religious in our ways. Why? Because, you know, you're still in the flesh. But when you walk in the spirit, that is totally a different paradigm. And, you know, I'm still kind of studying that, and I'm sure you all are. And then that is actually the invitation to walk in the spirit is, again, the invitation that will trigger us to come up here. To me, I, I, earlier when I was just getting ready for tonight, I was just saying, you know, the Spirit of God was saying to me, everything that I say to you is an invitation. And it is an open door. It is an opening for you to come into my presence. And so, you know, it's just, uh, but I feel like here in Revelation 4, it is so magnified because we need to see, we need to be in the spirit of Revelation 4 and 5 to, to, to embolden us and to equip us for the next chapters, the understanding of the next chapters. I, I think that's it. But what you're saying is, is yeah, you, you, you're perfectly right. But I just wanted us to just kind of allow uh, ourselves to see it from that vantage point of uh, Revelation 3. Jesus knocking at the door. And he's really saying to us as a church, because it's, remember, this is the conversation with the seven churches, but most specifically for the La Laodicean church. Hey, I'm, I'm outside. You kick me out. Now bring me in. Let me enter. Let me have fellowship with you. Let me spend time with you. And, and, and those are the key that will turn that door to open in heaven, in the presence of God. And that's why, and then, you know, that's why the word after this, after what, what this, what is after this, after all that conversation, chapter one, two, and three, come up here. Now you have this understanding of here. Now you have this desire for me here. And I will open the door for you. I'm the door. Enter through me that you may find pasture. I mean, actually, I mean, there's it's 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 up to you how you perceive this. But the key is for us to be, I believe, to be insulated by that beauty, by that government. By the power of the throne. See, Jesus re uh, was given the right, the, the authorization to reveal himself to the church. And then in chapter four, uh, 
Jesus opened the door for us to get a revelation of who God is, his throne, his government, his beauty, his power, the life, uh, the kind of life uh, existing in, in, in the presence of God or in heaven. Because we're going to come to, you know, the next the next part, which is we will see all the judgment coming down to earth. And it is going to be horrifying. And we need to understand that the throne of God is covered with mercy. Because before judgment, he releases mercy. But he cannot not release judgment because when judgment is on the earth, righteousness prevails. So, you know, all that coming together. All right. That was good. <laughs> I mean, so much. I mean, you cannot just gloss this over. I mean, we can stay in chapter four and five for a long period of time and really get to it. But I think it's sufficient for us to, uh, to see and allow the Holy Spirit to just really, you know, I just want to be mesmerized. And, uh, and and mobilized to go to the next chapters and to understand, you know, what the end times is all about and uh, to grow in such an intimacy and love for God that I will not want to sin, that I will not want to be to look at somebody else with uh, with envy with greed or with uh, condemnation or with just you know impatience or anger or cruelty but just look at them in the same manner that God looks at us with his eyes of compassion i mean you know amen I mean, I, I want to hear one, one, one young people to say something, and then we'll close. I'll share something because I, like what I shared last week, I just was really challenged because, especially this invitation to come up, like that, that already establishes that you already have a certain foundation with the Lord, and He wants you to ascend in a new way, in a new place. And I think that's so special to me because. There's like when reading the Bible, of course, it's living and active, but there's, I feel like if I look at John's perspective, there's just so much words that you could put when it came to describing what was happening in the throne room and in heaven. And to see that that is just a glimpse of the reality of what is actually happening in the throne room. It's just beautiful because whenever I look at reading the word, I, of course, I see it as like a doorway uh, to, to having a greater revelation of who Jesus is, especially when it comes to verses like, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness shall be added unto you. It's one thing to read it, but it's a whole other thing to experience the reality of that word made in my life. And so now when it comes to this, like how is it any different from Revelation 4, Revelation 5, even though like of course, uh, Matthew 6.33 is a verse that, you know, a lot of us mm -hmm. know and a lot of us say, and a lot of us even get to experience, we, we too can experience the same reality with the word. And so when I apply that to Revelation 4 and 5, I'm like, Lord, wow, like this is an invitation that you're inviting me to. And it is not just words on a page or it is not just something to study, but it is something to experience. And mm -hmm. so now every time we do this study, I'm always challenged to really see and experience what it's like to be mm -hmm. up there, to, to see what the elders see, to see what the creatures see. Because every time, especially whenever I hear about the descriptions of, of all the eyes, I'm always just, rem I'm always just reminded yeah. like, wow, like they need all these eyes just to see yeah. the glory, the beauty, the splendor of the Lord. <laughs> like, wow, like what, what is it like to even just mm -hmm. get a glimpse of that? And so the Lord has really been putting in my heart and challenging my heart to ascend, to, to go up there. Because the thing with the Lord is he is so willing to show himself to those who are, who are, who are mm -hmm. so hungry, to those who are so desperate. And I really resonated with what you shared, Pastor, last week on Sunday about uh, are we as a people really desperate to see God in this way? And I think that's the heart that I want to carry, this desperation to really see him because I want my life to be transformed, not because of the things that I the good things that I do, but because of 
the way that I see him. And so that's just something that the Lord has just been challenging me and something that honestly is really encouraging because yeah. just to, to realize that John experienced this, not like randomly, like how many hours and hours of prayer was John probably in before he got to experience something so magnificent. And so like for me, it also challenges me, like how many hours of prayer am i am i willing to go into even though i may not experience like something like that like john probably didn't like expect that either but then the hours and hours of prayer resulted in that like wow like i also want to be uh committed to prayer in that way that even though I, like i may be in isolation or in the wilderness like i believe that the lord will reveal himself in his time and just seeing that is just so beautiful. And so, yeah, I'm really just encouraged and challenged by, by the study that we're doing. Yeah. What, uh, what, um, what I got from, you know, listening to Dalton, he says, no longer will you just be praying, but you become prayer. No longer will you just be worshiping, but you become worship. You become that, you know, that's why, uh, you know, it's not really the how long John, uh, the apostle, was praying, but how how permanent was his dwelling place in the presence of God? Because that's when you know when you're in the presence of God, that's when you don't tire in praying. Because praying becomes you. You're not just praying, but you are prayer. You're not just worshiping, but you are worship you become that you know you become who you behold and so as we look at the throne we begin to see i mean i i am mesmerized by the many uh adjective and adverbs that you know defines the throne room but one thing that really got to me is that it's surrounded by mercies i have a plugging Hopefully, my my first book really it's 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 just a you know a calendar journal slash journal book. It's it's being published right now. It's being formatted. I mean, my editor is working on it. With a dip, you know, and you know what the title is: God's Daily Mercies. That's the title of my first book. I I I I had this first book done also in the Philippines before. I think I think 1984 or 1985 I did publish one of those God's Daily Mercies but this one is it's kind of a uh just an intro to to <laughs> so I'm plugging that in so guys when it comes uh I will let you know uh whether you can get it from Amazon or whatever whichever outlet you know you can get it and the beautiful thing about this is I'm not you know um forced to order several copies i mean i can only you know you can just go there and buy it as and then they will as you order it they will print it and they'll make it something to that effect i'm not sure and so i'm getting ready my my second one we'll see how that is i'm very timid actually in in doing this because i did feel like you know i could even write <laughs> but you know so anyways, yeah, so this is where we are. Hopefully that can be a fundraising for us as well. Um, we're raising funds, hopefully, to go to the Philippines next year. And uh, we'll see that right now. We're kind of uh, trusting God for all of our resources. So pray for us. Pray for us and pray for each other. <laughs> so on. So, okay, who's supposed to close us in prayer tonight? Uh, I, me, Randu. Rendu, yes. okay, Rendu. Close okay. right. Anybody else who wants to say something or no more? Okay. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for the revelation that you have given to us, to every single person that has received uh, just even a, a, a greater uh, glimpse of your beauty, Lord, even uh, just for understanding a little bit more than before what's going on in that throne room. And Father, I pray that as we keep our eyes on the throne, as we keep our eyes to the one that's on the throne, uh, Father, I pray that it stirs within us a deep desire to accept the invitation that you
you have given us. Uh, Father, I pray that we not only see and experience what's going on in the throne room, but Father, I pray that we are marked by it. I, I pray that we are truly marked by the mm -hmm. beauty of Jesus, that it, 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 it's not just something that we see, but I pray that it is evident in our lives, that it changes the way that mm -hmm. uh, we, we do our every single day. Lord, I pray that it influences our decisions. It, it, it changes the way that we read your word, that mm. influences the way that we come before you in prayer. Yeah. Uh, in our in our secret place time, Lord, I, I pray that it influences the way that we preach the gospel and we and we speak to the lost. That I, I pray that it, it influences and it changes the way that we pray, oh Lord, for healing and for the sick, oh Lord. Uh, I pray that it, it it changes every single thing about us, and Lord, I pray that it is what motivates us uh, to stay in Your will. That it would motivate us to pursue purity and righteousness and holiness. Father, that it that it that it that it motivates us to continue to seek you more than we ever have before. Mm. Father, I pray that this that this desire, Lord, just becomes this fire within us uh, that mm. will not grow weary, that will not grow cold, that will not stop burning. Uh, but Father, that as we keep our eyes, oh Lord, on Jesus, uh, that it continuously uh, refuels, that it will continuously uh, add on even more fire, even more intimacy, even more passion uh, mm -hmm. to keep going until we find ourselves there in the throne room. God, I pray uh, that we do not grow tired just like the four living creatures uh, mm -hmm. with those eyes. Lord, I, I pray that this song that they are singing, Lord, I pray that we start to sing it ourselves, uh, Lord, not just out of repetition, but out of wonder. Lord, by, by, out, of, out of awe and, and amazement, because we see the beauty of Jesus, because we actually see you face to face. Father, I pray, Lord, that we uh, would not stop, oh Lord, in this seeking, but we would just seek even more, Lord, every single, uh, every single day that as we meet with you, Father, I pray that is from this perspective, oh Lord. And as we study this even further, I pray that our paradigms continue to shift, that our perspectives continue to shift, uh, so that we see you more clearly and that we become more like you. And so, Father, even as we end this meeting and we we go to bed or we continue on our day, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would continue to re reveal things to us, that you would continue to speak to us, and that we would have ears that would hear. And so, mm -hmm. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Thank you, guys.